Hello and welcome to Module 5. So in Module 5, our goal is to look at how you can use collections of data in both a list and a dictionary. And to do that, we'll um, see how the data is used in memory and on a, on a hard drive in the form of a text file. So we'll be moving data from the text file into memory, from memory into the text file. That's going to be a large part of the, the module and certainly a large part of your assignment. But in addition to that, we're going to add on more features that will make your programs look more professional. So we'll look at script templates and uh, some structured error handling. We'll investigate how functions work and see some examples of uh, functions. Uh, we will look at um, how you can use source uh, source control software called GitHub and uh, just a few more things too. So these are also things that we're going to build on as we go through the course, uh, but this is uh, kind of our first experience with a number of these things. Anyway, I think there's uh, it's going to be a lot of fun. Um, let's go ahead and get started. From your module five notes, you can see the order that we're going to cover these topics. Uh, first thing on the list is, well, lists. So lists are something we saw in the previous module as well. And the idea behind a list is that it's a collection of values that you manage under a single name. So you set up a variable, you have that variable point to a list object, that list object holds multiple values, and you can access those individual values by using a, uh, an indexed, key, um, indexed subscript. So the example that we saw, or something very similar, was where I made a variable, I called it list row, because I can, you can think of a, a list as a row of data. Uh, at first I don't have any data in it, but I can make sure that the variable knows that I'm going to load, it as, uh, load up a list in it by putting in square brackets. The square bracket operators on the right hand side of the equal sign indicates that you want a list object. Then I can point to a new list object by just putting in the values. Now I could have put this on one row, or excuse me, one line of code. I didn't have to make two lines of code, but sometimes it's helpful. Uh, not as much in Python, but in other languages to declare your variables first and then go through and set them after the fact. Uh, again, this is, um, this is something that's more applicable in other languages than Python. And since this is an introduction to programming course, uh, not specifically targeted at becoming a Python programmer, um, I'm going to go ahead and continue to do that throughout the, throughout the course. Anyway, so I declare a variable and I set the variable's value after the fact uh, to this one row of data, which is a ID of one, a name of Bob Smith, an email of Bob Smith or bsmith at hotmail.com. That's just some made up data I've, I'm putting together. Now, I'm also adding in a slash n to indicate that there is a carriage return line feed, a new line. Um, I'm doing that because we're going to be working with text files. And when you're working with text files, they will have these invisible new line characters. I want to kind of include that so I can talk about how to remove them as we go through the code. So it looks a little unusual and normally you wouldn't put that new line in a piece of a line of code like this, but I'm doing it for the effect of being able to, to remove it and work with it a little bit later. Well, you'll notice that when I print out the list, if I just call, call print and put the list variable in, variable in, it'll actually print out the contents of the, um, of the list, the elements of the list, the at first uh, zeroth element one, the first element, Bob Smith, and the second element, uh, bsmith at hotmail.com with the slash n in it, with square brackets around it. That is the default behavior of printing out a list object. It'll go ahead and format the contents of the list with the square brackets. Now, if you don't want that, and sometimes you don't, you don't want to present that to the user. What you can do is you can just extract out the individual elements or items inside the list by just using their subscript. So this would be list row sub one, or excuse me, sub zero, 
list row sub 1, list row sub 2. And each one would be extracted. I can then format it in any way I want. A common format is using uh, carried uh, comma separated values. Now note that when I did this, I'm still capturing the invisible new line character, but when I print it out, that invisible character just disappears, kinda, it's invisible. It's still there. That's why I have this print statement that says, note the invisible new line. And you can see that there's a space between the output row of data and that little note uh, about the invisible line. So it may not look like it's there, but it is. It is, it is there. You just have to keep uh, your eyes open for it. Whenever you make a list, it stores the data in that list in memory. So that's great because memory is really fast. The problem is, is that if you close this program, the script, then the data in memory just disappears. If you want to persist it, you need to store it someplace. And the place you typically will store it, especially at the beginning of your professional programming career, is within text files. So text files are an easy way to store data, and as we've seen in the previous module, they're not difficult to, to work with. Here's an example. Um, I'm going to persist the data in a file called mydata.txt. So I'll define my variables, declare my variables up here, uh, a row, um, a list of data in a row, a string of data for the name of the text file, uh, obj file, an object, file object I'm going to use, and uh, once I've done that, I've to process the data like this. I open up the, the file. Now notice that I'm using the file name via the string variable. I'm also not putting in the path. I'm not putting in the path like this, although I can do it. Let's uh, see, Python class. I could do this, but I'm choosing not to. And if I don't put a, a, a path in there, what will happen is that it will create the, the file when I open it. If it doesn't exist, um, directly next to the script file that we're running. So if this script file is in the Python class folder, we will see that show up there. So for example, let's say I've got this file right here. Listing 2. It's the same code we're looking at. And I'm going to open up the, the folder where the file is. Now you can see that there's a mydata.txt file. I'm going to go ahead and delete that. And I'm now going to run this. And you will see that that file has come back. And of course it put in the data that I told it to. And I told it to do so right here where I said open the file make a, a list object and then write the data in that list to the file. Once I'm all done, I need to close the connection to the file. Closing the connection is important. Although Python, as, as in so many ways, it's it, um, the writing to the file and closing the connection to the file is automatic. It's considered best practice to go ahead and close it as soon as you're done using it. Uh, Python will forgive you, but it's not the best way to write your code. So always put close in there uh, when you think about it. So a simple way of taking the data from a list object and persisting it down on your hard drive. Very, very easy to, to do. Now, if you have data in a file and you want to load it from the file back up into memory, uh, you can use very similar code. Now, the reason why you want to do this is because you never ever use the data directly from the file in your program. You actually always load it into memory and then you use it out of memory. This is going to be true even when you're working with advanced database programs. They always load the data from the hard drive where it's persistently stored up into memory and then you use it there. This is one of the reasons why, whenever you're using professional database software, it takes up a lot of memory. The more memory, the better, because you need a place to store all that large amounts of data in memory. In our case, there's, there's not much being stored because it's such a small amount of data. But the principle is still the same. And uh, let's take a look at an example here. So in this example, 
I'm going to read the data. So I'm going to go ahead and specify the read option. So W for write and R for read. Uh, there's also A for append. Uh, so I'm going to open the file for reading. Now it's still the same file. And then I'm going to use a for loop to loop through the contents of that file. Now this is a great little feature that is a part of uh, Python. The ability to treat the contents of the file as if it was a collection of data. So I can actually go through and pull out each row of data. Sometimes you'll see it with uh, like an I here or something like that. I, I like to, I prefer using the word row, uh, mostly because I have a, a strong database background. And I think of a row of text as like a row of data. So for me, this is one row of data. This would be another row of data, another row of data, etc. So I'm going to go ahead and use the word row. Actually, I guess I should go ahead and keep that in there. Got to have that carriage return because it's going to use that carriage return to identify each row of data. Okay, so uh, let me save it. Save. There we go. Now, we're going to pull that data out, but I'm going to split it up based on a comma. That's a very common thing to do. So if I come back over here and I take a look at this file, we can see we have these commas. And notice that I don't have any spaces between the ending of the name and the beginning of the email or the ending of the ID and the beginning of the name. I'm not using any of that. I'm just um, storing the data as comma separate values in this file, this text file. So I'm going to split it based on that. And then we're going to look at the contents of that row based on that split. And notice that the split is going to give me back a list object. Let's see what happened. So I'll come over here, I'll pull that up. And this is the same code. And watch what happens when I read it. It goes through and pulls it up. Now let's see here. It got an error message because I've got something going on here. Something I must have added to the file. <laughs> Index out of range. Now, what, whenever you get an index out of range error message, it usually means that these numbers are out of range. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to comment this line of code out. We're going to check it again. Mm -hmm. So there's something in there that's causing a problem. So now what we have to do is figure out where that issue is. Is it in the second? Let's go ahead and change that to zero. Didn't work. Is it in the, um, actually let's go ahead and take all this out. That one worked. We got no error message, so it's not a problem there. Let's go ahead and we'll take this one out. Doesn't seem to be a problem there, but notice that if we look here, what we're not getting, let me clear this out. We're getting some odd behaviors in here, and it has to do with that file not being correctly formatted. I'm sure of it. Somehow we've picked up extra stuff. Oh, look at that. You can't see it, but there's two extra spaces there. Let me go ahead and delete these. Let's see, that should do it, and we'll try again. Good. So when you're working with these files, this is something you have to be careful of. They have these invisible characters, and if you don't clean them up, they will give you these odd errors. That's, that's the way you fix them, you kind of isolate where the problem is, and you look between the files and the actual code and try it back and forth until you uh, find the exact point where things are failing. Now, I'd like you to try this lab out. See if you can make a little file that has home inventory data. So 
uh, a set of items and a set of values. So one item, one value. So a lamp would be worth 30 bucks, an end table would be worth 60 bucks. Just make up some data, make up some names if you want to add more than this. Uh, in fact, why don't you just go ahead and do this. Why don't you use this example data, use this example data to start off with. And then if you want to add more, you can. So the idea would be to take this code I've given you some starter code and see what you would have to modify to make this happen. What I mean by this is I want you to be able to read and write data from a file. So first thing you have to do is you have to examine this code I'm giving you and figure out what it's doing. I gotta tell you, it's not doing a whole lot right yet. Uh, currently, it's missing the piece that lists the data to a file, send the list data to the file, and I'm missing the code that reads the data from the file into a list. Now, luckily for us, it makes it a little bit easier when I flagged it with the words to do. So if I go ahead and take this code, and I copy it, and I come over here to make myself a new file, You notice how I've got these little spots here where I've got to do, and that's where I want you to put your code. So examine the code, figure out what it's trying to do, and you add on to the code to, to make it work. So review it, copy and paste the code, replace the name and date at the top. What I mean by that is up here at the top where it's in yellow, your name, the date, and then replace the code that says to do with the code that's going to make this work. When you're done, test it and you should be able to see it looks something like this. When they choose to write the data, you can go and look at the file and see that it's there, where the data's been written. And when they choose to read the data, like here I've used the R, it should show you the contents of item, value, lamp, $30, end table, $60. And of course, it'll keep pop going through that menu until you type an exit and the program ends. Please go ahead and see if you can modify that and get that to work. Okay, so here's the code I came up with. Remember that my code and your code doesn't have to look exactly the same, but it's going to look similar. So first thing I'm going to do is go ahead and put the, um, the new notes in the changelog section of my script header. So the, the new date, uh, this actually isn't the date, but it'll serve its purpose for right now. Uh, add it, read and write file code. That's what I was doing. And of course, my, my name. And I come down here and I look for those to-do sections. And um, I want to put in the, the code that'll do it. So uh, work with it. So I'm going to make the list and write it to a file. Well, I've already got the, the do I have the list? Nope. I'm going to have to get the stuff for the list. So first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to go ahead and create a list with item and value. I open up the file, I create the list, and I write it to the file. Then I put lamp and 30. I write that to the file. Then I put end table and 60, and I write that to the file. Now notice that I'm adding on the new line so that in the text file, each of these lines has a new line at the end, so it'll write underneath. When we read it back out of the file, that's going to be important. And I'll close the connection to the file, and that ends this run through that particular loop. Now, that only occurs if they type in a W for write. If they type in a R for read, it's going to follow, follow a different pattern. It's going to open up the file, but in read mode this time, not write mode. And for each row of data in that file, it's going to loop through it, split it, and I'll present it onto the screen. When it works, you should get something like this where I can go ahead and read, or excuse me, write to the file and read from the file. And of course, I can also exit. If I can type out exit, that is. Hopefully you got that to work. If not, take a moment to go ahead and, and uh, compare your code to mine, find out uh, where things went um, wrong, 
and, and fix it and then move on to the next section. I'll see you back in a few minutes. So we've seen information about tuples and information about lists. We're also going to look at information about dictionaries. Now, in this module, we focus on working with lists and dictionaries. In the previous module, we worked with tuples and lists. So this is kind of a, a change. Dictionaries are a nice feature. They have additional methods, kind of like lists do, that's specific to working with the data. And they also have a, one interesting feature. The feature is that the subscript can be um, character data or is character data instead of uh, numeric data. Now, in some languages, whenever you have something that looks like a dictionary, sometimes they're called a hash, uh, sometimes they're, uh, there's a variety of things. Anyway, in some languages, you can use either a subscript that is a number, an index, or a subscript that is a key, character data. In Python, it's just character data. But do be aware that it is possible in other languages. So, we're working with Python, let's just focus on that. And here's the syntax for setting up one of these dictionaries. First thing, you use curly braces instead of square brackets to indicate that you want a dictionary. And you indicate the key, that's the name of the subscript that's character data, it's called a key. You indicate the key, whatever that could be, uppercase, lowercase, mixed case, makes no difference, make something up, and then you put a colon and put the value after that. Now I have everything as character data, but it can put in any type of object you, you want, including complex things like a tuple or a list if you want it to. Although typically, especially in this course, uh, we're not gonna be using something that complex. Now the advantage of doing that is it's pretty self-descriptive. If I look at one here and I see that the key is an ID, I assume that's the ID of one. If I look at name and I see Bob Smith, I assume that that is indeed the name. And of course, email. You could argue that the values themselves are pretty much self-descriptive. However, when we start getting to much more complex things or even something simple like adding multiple phone numbers, one might be a cell phone, one might be a work phone. Um, in that case, these keys are really quite handy because they identify the, the value. Now, to work with it, to pull the data out of the dictionary once it's put in there, you can use the key just like you would any other subscript. So remember that the subscript that has character data is called a key. The subscript that has numeric data, um, a numeric um, subscript is called an index. So a subscript with character data is called a key. A subscript with numeric data is called an index. People mix them up all the time though. So don't be too worried if you hear somebody at a, in a conference, uh, conference room, re, uh, go ahead and say key and subscript interchangeably with the official one is one I just gave you. Anyway, that's it. So when I go ahead and reference that, it'll pull out the data just like before. If I just print the dictionary, you'll see it with the curly braces around it really pretty easy to work with. And as you're going to learn, uh, as you read the chapter in your, your book in this module, or uh, whatever we're using at the time, maybe some web articles, you'll see that uh, there's a bunch of extra functions that come with dictionaries that are pretty handy. Now, when I'm working with dictionaries, I find them very useful for representing a row of data. Um, like I said, I work a lot with databases. So for me, it makes a lot of sense to think of it as a dictionary as a self-describing row of data. And what I do is I make these rows of data and I'll put them into a list to form a table um, of data. So a table of data would be something like if I had a spreadsheet, if I open up Excel and I have a spreadsheet, we have these tables of data. We've got columns and rows, and I'm talking about describing that. Uh, in a database program like MySQL or Microsoft SQL Server or Access, we also have tables. And these tables hold the data that we're in. And of course, in that case, it's going to be like ID, name, email, and then we put in our values one after another. And here's what I'm suggesting is that we 
use our dictionary to uh, indicate a row of data and then we use a collection of dictionary objects uh, by creating an, a list object to hold the dictionaries, the dictionary rows. So here's how that would look. First of all, I'll go ahead and make a couple rows to work with. Dictionary row one and dictionary row two. You can see I've got my two different um, people on here. Uh, Bob at uh, ID number one and Sue at ID number two. And I just put that in a list object to form a table of data. So I'm gonna go ahead and call it list table. Now, when I print out the list, which is a print statement, it will print out the list with square bracket curly brace, one row of data, comma curly brace, one other row of data, comma curly brace, another row of data, and then a square bracket to indicate uh, we're, we're done. If, um, if I use a loop, I can just, of course, loop through the, the list and print out the individual rows, uh, which makes it a little bit easier to read. But you notice that the, the dictionary, when I'm just using the print command, prints out with the curly braces, and of course, the list object prints out with the square brackets. Now, I can do something like this. This is a feature that comes with dictionaries, which is kind of cool. I can use a function called items. Items allows me to unpack the items into key and value pairs. So each one of these variables will have the, some, some data, but one will be the key and one will be the value. And that way I can custom print out something like this. The key equals the value. The key equals the value. The key equals the value. And you can see here that I'm just using that variable or those variables to get that results. That way I can format it any way I want. Now you can also just go ahead and call the values or the keys function. If you call the values function, it will just give you a set of values. See how it gives me a list of values back? It's extracted out the values, but it's not in curly braces. It's actually in a list. You see the little list object? Also, the way it's displaying it is dictionary values. Now, notice I didn't do that format. That's something that was built into Python. I just said, call the function values and show me the data. If I use keys, it does this. It makes up a list with the keys. Now, that could be quite handy if I was trying to print something in a, a pretty format. Uh, where I want to have the, the first row be the key, so I have the columns, ID, name, and email, and then any subsequent rows of data print out the, the ID and the name and the email underneath that. So very handy little functions that are built into to dictionary. Uh, and this, um, this feature where it unpacks the uh, key and value is also really pretty sweet when you're working with them. As you might suspect, you can also take data from a text file and put it back into a dictionary. So that can be handy as well. Depends on what you want to do. Sometimes dictionaries are more handy to work with. Other times, just simple lists are more handy to work with. Um, you get to make the choice as a developer. But here's an example of how you would do that if I want to use a dictionary. So first thing I do is I, I go ahead and declare my variables. And uh, I'm going to go ahead and set up my little table here. I've got the, um, the ID and the name and the email, and I'm going to uh, add that to my empty list so far, use, use the append. That way I'm not just replacing the, the list object, I've actually added onto the existing list object. It's not much different, especially at this level, um, but probably a little bit better for performance. And I'll just loop through it just to show that there's some data in it, and I'll get some information from the user ID, name, and email, build myself a new dictionary row, append that to the table, and then print it out. So it would just start off with, I'd have just that one row I hard-coded in. Hard-coding means that I have it already typed in. I'm not asking for the user to give me information. I'm not waiting any, on anybody to give me information which is different than this, in which case I'm capturing information from the end user. I'm getting some user input. And then using that user input to, to build myself a dictionary row, 
and checking to make sure that the, the row is actually printing out as it should, and it does. So next, I wanna start working with that file. So let's take a look at this one, example eight. Start off the same way, I have my variables declare at the top, I open the file, I'm going to read the data. When the data comes back, I'm going to split it up into a list because the split function returns a list object. So I'm gonna go ahead and capture that. And then I'll just put in the keys and extract out the values from the list. So you won't be able to drag out the data directly from the text file into the dictionary, but you can drag it out from the text file into a list object and then use the elements of the list to build yourself a dictionary and append that to the table itself. Not too bad. Notice that I'm using the strip function. Um, that's gonna be important as because there's lots of times where you end up with extra spaces or other extra characters, such as the, the hidden invisible carriage return uh, that you don't wanna work with. You don't wanna have it there. Strip will take that off. It'll take off the spaces. It'll also take off that invisible carriage return. So it's a good one to know because I don't really want that in there. And you'll notice up here where I'm getting user input, uh, strip can be important in there too, although you don't have it in here, because users are inclined to make simple mistakes like hitting the space bar when they really didn't mean it. Good function to know about. Anyway, so that's reading the data from the file. And what I'd like you to try to do is I'd, try to, I'd like you to try this lab where you're going to go and uh, once again, you're going to take some code. I've got this listing right here. Is that right? Yep, listing nine, we're gonna take that code, we're gonna copy it out. And in this case, we're going to fill up the data with um, some code I've already presented. If this looks a lot like the solution to uh, the first lab, there's a reason for that, it is. But then, after you get that working, I want you to, once again, locate uh, some spaces in the code. In this case, I didn't mark it with to do. I want you to locate the spaces or places, I'm sorry, the places where I'm using a list and ask yourself, should it be a list or could it be a dictionary? And when it can be a dictionary, I want you to see if you can replace it. Try to replace it with a dictionary object. See if uh, you can, where you can use a list and where you can use a, uh, a dictionary. Once again, my recommendation is um, whenever we're working with a row of data, we can use a dictionary. That's our goal in this lab. Why don't you go ahead and, and uh, pause the video, give it a try, and then come back when you're done. See you in a bit. Well, here's my solution. Let's see, uh, see how I did it. So the first thing I did was I looked for all the places where I had a list row and, and replaced it with dictionary row. Now that happened in several places. If I highlight it in PyCharm, you can see that it shows the highlighted sections. So I just um, changed the name, and I also went ahead and changed the square brackets to curly braces. Now you'll look, and you'll see that where I did this, I had to change it from just putting in the value alone to putting in the value and the key. Because when I use a list object, I don't need the key. But other than that, and of course the curly braces, it's pretty similar. There's really not that much difference. So you can see here I've got um, the dictionary and I've got the row. Uh, if I want to, to work with this, I can go ahead and, let's see, why did I do it this way? I think just to show you that what the difference is. So here I can write out the item clamp and I can write it the value 30. And uh, here, I've just gone ahead and done the something similar. Actually, I'm not sure why I did this. I think, yeah, it must be because I wanted to, to show you how easy it was to change it. This is the problem when you wait a couple days between the time you wrote the code and the time you read it. <laughs> you can forget uh, exactly what you were thinking at the time. Okay, so we got that and we got uh, value. Here we go. And of course we change this to a curly brace and this name becomes dictionary row. 
And there we have it. So not very difficult as far as changing this to make it something I can use in, in my code. So now it's just a matter of writing that to the file when we're done. And um, just makes it really easy. Now when I pull it out of the, the file to read it back up, I have to, to once again split it into a list object and then pull out the individual values like this. So the I say values, let's use the word element. That's the, the fancier term for it, especially since I'm using a key called value. So the zeroth element would be in the first row, that would be lamp. And then the, the first element would be $30. And then of course the next row, it would be end table and $60, exactly what we would expect. So that's how I'd write my code. Um, and hopefully it worked for you. Of course, I need to check, make sure it works. Let's, uh, let's make sure it does. W and read. And we see the, the data here. Item, lamp, 30, end table, value, 60. Uh, notice that I've still got my little carriage returns in there. If, um, if I want to get rid of those, I can strip them off. And you'll see that they're they're currently gone now. And we'd always want to check to make sure that the, the file has the data we expect. Oops, I think that's the wrong file, guys. Here's the home inventory one. So the character turns are in here. You just can't see them. Once again, your code and my code does not have to look the same, but please uh, take some time to look over this example. Make sure it makes sense to you and then we'll move on to the next section. Over the decades, people have come up with lots of things that will improve programming. We're going to talk about a few of them. Uh, the first one is something called the separation of concerns. So the idea behind the separation of concerns is that you want to program or organize your program in such a way that they can easily be um, disassembled and rebuilt in other locations for other projects, um, maybe even have the actual code distributed into other systems on the same machine to, um, to empower them to, to use memory more efficiently or to be able to interact with other aspects of, of other programs currently running on the same machine. So very common technique of building multi-leveled or multi-tiered application. And we're going to look at that a little bit later on in the course. But for right now, let's just focus on separating the code into individual sections based on some kind of concern, focus, some kind of focus, uh, such as a layer of data, a layer of processing and a layer of presentation concepts that I've been introducing since the beginning. So most of the time you want to kind of start off with this. This is the basics that you want to work with. I have a section for data. I have a section for processing and one for presentation. Now presentation is typically some kind of input from the user or output to the user. And those are kind of the starting points. Um, you might want to go ahead and formally just give them a little name and put a little bit of, uh, well, not pseudocode per se, but maybe a, a comment here. An example of data would be where you declare variables or constants, or are gonna use constants. An example of processing is where you take the, the data in those variables or constants, and you perform some kind of task or actions on them. And of course, the presentation piece would be things like getting information or data from the user, or of course, displaying it to them. Here's some examples, um, something I used similar in uh, previous co uh, modules. So let's say I go ahead and have two numbers, number one and number two. Uh, I'm going to make them floating point values. So the first thing I have is uh, zero and zero for my floating point values. I'm, I'm, I'm setting some initial values. They may not be the values I'm going to use later on, but I set some initial values. And that's actually important in some programming languages, you have to declare the variable and you have to initialize the variable. 
uh, you can either do it all on one line or do it on several lines. In Python, it's much more forgiving. Um, but again, in other programming languages, you have to initialize the variable. And this is the way you do it. You set some initial values. So the, when this code started to run, the first thing it would do would be to create a variable called floating point number one. And it would initialize it with a value of 0, 0.0. Then it would create floating point number two and initialize it with the values of 0, 0.0. Now, in the presentation section, I'm going to uh, go ahead and get some information from the user in the form of a first number and a second number. So the, oops, forgot to color code that, didn't I? There we go. Uh, first thing, a uh, third thing it's going to do is get the number from a user and put it in my variable. So I had some initial values, but they're no longer being used. They've been replaced by some data that I got from the user. The same thing happens on the fourth uh, command that it's going to execute, getting the, the data from the user and putting it in number two. Now next, I'm going to um, divide the first number by the second number and come up with a quotient. So I'll make a variable uh, called floating point quotient and I will uh, go ahead and initialize that variable with this initial value. Now do note that in other languages you actually have to go through and you have to declare the variable before you use them. Once again, Python does not demand this, but you will often see in my code in this class anyway, where I go ahead and define all the variables at the top. Now the advantage of doing that is that you can see all the players in the script. So you can look at one spot and see all the types of data we're going to use. And if you put a comment right next to it, indicating what you were uh, meaning to use that data for, uh, that could be quite useful in a complex script. Uh, but again, in Python, it doesn't matter. In fact, it's kind of frowned upon by the Python um, faithful to do anything but initialize the variable only as you need it, create it only as you need it, and work with it from there. Two different schools of thought on that, but it doesn't matter much. Anyway, you can see that when I print out the, the quotient, it prints out the number as you would expect from that division of the entry in 4 and 5. I get 0.8. And that's exactly what we'd expect to happen in this, this code. Now, do notice that sometimes when you're trying to divide your program up into uh, multiple sections, these separation of concern sections, um, it's difficult sometimes to get pure code. So this is pretty pure presentation input-output code because I'm getting input from the user and presenting, of course, uh, a little message like enter the first number. But down here in the processing section, I'm doing some processing of uh, the numbers by dividing them and getting some results, but I've also put in some processing code, or excuse me, presentation code in the form of a print statement. So it would be nice if it was purely processing code in the processing section and presentation code in the presentation section and data code in the data section. That would be nice. And you try to strive for that, but sometimes it's not always possible to get it exact. So you just try to get as close as you can. And at the beginning, it, it can be quite hard, but as you have more and more practice, you'll see that it gets easier. Now, one thing that makes it easier is learning how to use functions. Um, using functions allows you to separate your code into little sections uh, that you have much more control over as far as when those sections run. Normally a script starts at the top and just works its way down, down, down to the bottom of the script and the way you've typed out the code is the order that the code is going to run. So for example, in the last uh, example, I had to put the print down here after I did some processing. But with functions, I can separate that. I can actually control the flow of the program a lot better. This also makes the uh, code a lot more reusable in future projects as well. So functions are a very useful tool. So what it is, is a function is a name set of one or more statements. So you have a <coughs> excuse me, you have a, one or more statements, you give that set of statements a name, and then you can call that function and have those statements run. 
Um, let's see here. Here's an example of how this works. So you can see I'm declaring my variables. And then after I've declared my variables, I have a processing section. Now notice that the processing section is before the presentation section this time. In the processing section, I've defined a function called divide values. The divide values function only has one line of code inside of it. You can tell that the code's inside of it because in Python, you have a indentation. In other languages, they use curly braces to indicate the set of statements inside that function. Not in Python, though. So I've got the one, two, three, four spaces that Python likes to have, and I return the quotient of the first number divided by the second number. Now, when this code is reached, so the first thing the program starts, Python will start to do when it's reading my script is it'll start at the top, it'll work its way down, it'll get down to this definition of the function, but it won't run that function, it'll only load it into memory. And it'll wait until it comes across code that calls that function. So the next set of statements it runs is down here, in which case it captures the input from the user for the first number and then the second number. And then after that, it calls the function. Now when it calls the function, that would be the one, two, three, four, fifth statement that it has actually ran. Remember, it never ran the code in the function, it just loaded it in the memory. As soon as I call it though, it jumps to the function in memory and it starts running through its lines of code. In this case, there's only one line of code, but if there were 100 lines of code, it would run through each and every one. And when it finally finishes running through that lines of code, those lines of code, it'll jump back to where the function was called and continue on running all the other statements after that. Now, you can have tons. You can have many, many, many different functions in one script. As we'll see later on, you can actually take your functions and put them in a whole separate script and link the two together. That's pretty handy. It's called a module. But for right now, you can have 10 different functions or four different functions, as we'll see in a, a later lab, <clears throat> where you can call those functions one after the other. And this gives you a lot more control of when you're actually going to do the processing. So in this case, <clears throat> The processing is done, and then it comes back and it prints out the results in the presentation area. And now I'm not mixing presentation code and processing code. Up here I've got pure processing code, no presentation code involved. And that actually, folks, is a, a better way to go. This makes your code much more reusable. You see, when I'm working with something like a console application, I'm using print. But if I was working with something like a web application or even a windowed application, I probably wouldn't be using print. I'd be using some other command to present data to the user. Although the presentation code would change, the actual processing code would not if I keep the presentation code out of the processing layer. And this gives me a lot more flexibility and reusability of my own code. So it's a real good thing to practice. And it does take practice. You'll get, you'll get practice as we go through the course. Um, so try your best, realize it's going to take some time, it's going to be some growing pains, but I guarantee you that once you get used to using functions, you're going to be really happy that you, you did. It, it makes it so much easier to program and, and write the code once and use it many times. Functions make it easier to separate presentation and processing code. That's absolutely true. And we're going to look at functions as we continue on through the course. So this is more of a, a first time we look at it. Maybe actually, I think the third time we looked at it because I've introduced little bits of it as we've gone along, but it won't be the last. They're very important things. From the very first module, you've seen that I've organized my code kind of in a similar way pretty much every time. And if I'm going to continue to do that, it might be a good idea to make a basic starting template or script template that I can use so that there's consistency. You see, when my code looks more consistent and uh, consistent with myself and also my team members, my code looks more professional. And it also makes it easier for people to read my code that are on my team as well as myself if I look at it in the future. 
This is really an important concept, and using a script template is a great way to, to help enforce that consistency. And it doesn't take much effort either. So always try to, to get uh, started with some kind of script template if you can. Let's look at a, a simple script template that I've been kind of building up to as we've gone along in the course. Uh, you can see I have um, a little header here at the top. Python likes to have little spaces in here. So we can give it some spaces if you want. Um, doesn't really matter a whole lot. Uh, but I go through and I, I make it you know consistent. I try to make it look nice. I give it some kind of formatting, something that looks decent. If, you, uh, if you're going to use a template, a typical way to identify a place where people are supposed to replace something in a template looks like this, where you use a greater than and less than symbol. And then this indicates that that is something that should be replaced. So here I'd replace it with the title of the script. Here I'd replace it with the description of the script. And then the change log, I'd put in the dev, uh, developer, the dev, the, the date that uh, we're making the change and the, uh, the task that we're trying to accomplish when uh, on that particular date when we made the change. Of course, the first one would be actually creating the script. Uh, you can put in spaces if you want. You can leave spaces out. It makes no difference other than the fact you should be consistent. A lot of times I'll take the spaces out because I may want, uh, may want to read them into some kind of database uh, or uh, some other kind of program. Uh, remember that um, I can do so uh, by just reading this as a text file. And if I extract that data out, it's already kind of cleaned up. I can make a, a catalog, if you would, of all the scripts in a particular folder, maybe on my particular hard drive and all the things that I've done changing the files over time. Lots of fun things you can do to, to create what's known as metadata. Metadata is data about data. So this would be uh, data about the changes to my program. And of course, I have my section for data and processing and presentation. As you become more proficient uh, in programming, you may see other sections that you find useful that you want to include in your template or other things that you might find useful and want to include in your template. But this is a good place to start. And um, we use templates enough in the industry that mostly big development software has ways of including a template, a custom template that you make uh, right in the uh, IDE. So if I'm working with PyCharm, for example, I can go up to the Tools menu and then under the Tools menu, I'll see an option here for Save File as Template. And then under that, uh, when I click on it, it'll bring up a dialog box. The dialog box will let me put in a, temp, uh, a name for my template and actually just go ahead and put in uh, the, the text. Now, actually, the way I did this was uh, I made a file first and then I put in the template. And after that, I went up to Tools, Save File, Template, and that way I didn't have to put anything in here. It was just, it pulled it out of this file. So that's what the Save As is about. Um, then you click on the OK button and it's it's in. It's in the, uh, the system on your own computer. Now, if somebody else wants to use it, I may have to post that someplace where they can get access to my templates, like other team members. That could be on an internet um, website share, like Dropbox or, or Google Drive. Uh, it could be in an internal organization share, like on a network uh, file server. Uh, could be a lot of things. I could just send an email out and have that template available. And people would just go over to PyCharm and, and put that in or whatever IDE they're working with. Again, most of the advanced uh, professional IDEs have this ability because templates are extremely useful. Now, once I've got the template in place, uh, like in PyCharm, the way you work with it is like I'd click on the project and I'd say I want to make a brand new file, just like normal. But instead of choosing like the Python file, which is the default template for Python, I choose my custom file my custom template. And when I do so, uh, I would get something like this. Let's see, where'd you go, Python? Or PyCharm? Uh, let's see, I come over here, I right click, I say new. Oh, I guess I don't have the template in here. Okay, well, let's just fix that. Listing 12 was my template. Uh, let's see, they want spaces in there. We'll give them some spaces. What the heck? I got some spaces down here. This is not what I had in mind. Is that 13 I'm looking at? Let's just make a new one then. How's that? Yep, 
you know what I should do? I should just grab that from the text file. Silly me. Okay, just like that. Copy and go back. Paste it. There we go. Look it over, make sure it looks all right. Looks okay. And now we'll come up here to uh, Tools, Save File as Template, give it a name, Simple Template. And that's pretty much it. So now, whenever I want to make a new script, I just right click on here, say new, simple template, get a file like, I don't know, more test. And voila, we're good to go. And that way, it's, all my files will be consistent as we go through and work with it. Very, very handy. Now, another useful feature of of uh, Python, or actually almost all programming languages nowadays, that you can add to, to your code to make it look more professional and act more professional and just be better, is something called um, structured error handling. So error handling is something that you can, you pretty much always want to put into your code. And the idea is that you don't want to rely just on the engine, the programming engine, to capture the errors and manage it themselves, you want to have an active part of managing your errors yourself. And one of the reasons why you do this is because you want it to, you want to be able to control what the user sees, the user of your application sees. The people that put Python together or JavaScript or Java or C Sharp or C++, they wrote error messages for the developer of those languages. They didn't necessarily write error messages for the end user. And in your daily life, when you get error messages on a computer, you will often, if you're not familiar with that particular subject in depth, you often be the end user. And you may look at these error messages, scratch your head, wonder what the heck they're talking about. Whereas a developer of that particular language, or maybe of working with the, the internals of an operating system, would look at it, they would be able to interpret exactly what it meant and why it did something um, based on that error, uh, that would be useful for them, but probably wouldn't be very useful for you. And so when people are using our code, when people are using the, the application that we wrote, we, want to may have, we may want to extend the same courtesy we would like from others. That being simpler error messages, error messages that are uh, sensible to us as a end user uh, and with less technical details um, that are not really of much use at all. So for example, let's, um, let's say I go ahead and ha do something like try to divide by zero. So if I set a uh, floating point value of N2 to zero, and then I try to do division, this is the type of error message I would see. Now, you know, it, it is, the error message is pretty straightforward. Zero division error, float division by zero. As a developer, that makes sense to me. I see what they're talking about. This is a normal error message that they, I would see, and I could just send that up to the user with a traceback information and on line three, this thing occurred, etc. But to tell you the truth, it's not really user friendly. It's not really user friendly. So what we do is we make our own custom error handling. Um, and we put in user-friendly error messages so that user has a better chance of solving the problem without having to contact tech support and you know deal with the, all the the issues that come from this chain of, of support that you have to have in place. Now, many years ago, um, we used to write custom error handling very individualistic. So as a developer, I'd write it one way, when you doing a, another application, you'd write it very differently. Another person, a third person would write it different again. So what happened is that a concept became very prominent called structured error handling, in which case by using a particular structure of handling your errors in your code, my code and your code and somebody else's code would look very similar. Maybe not exactly the same, but very similar. So um, somebody came up with the concept of a try-accept block or try-catch block. 
So um, try catch is common, try accept is common, uh, they're pretty much the same thing. So the try accept or try catch block looks like this. Try some statements and if they succeed, great. But if not, if there's some kind of exception to the code, exception is uh, some kind of error, then jump down to the exception block and run that statement. In this case, when I try to divide by zero, the error still happens. That's not the issue. The issue is what kind of error message is going to be presented to the user. So in my case, I've had it print out an error occurred when trying to divide by zero, uh, five by zero, zero, uh, zero point zero. Now I could also put in there things like, please make sure not to divide by zero or some other type of message. And we can actually get quite specific with what me error messages are going to be presented based on very specific types of errors. Now to, um, to talk more about that, I'm going to delay that conversation to a, a later module where we can actually get into some of the cool options that come with this try except block uh, that makes our code a lot better. Uh, but for right now, um, I'd like you just to kind of play with it a little bit in its very basic form. Put your statements in a try block, try to do some stuff, and then just put a generic friendly error message in the accept block. Get used to working with that. And uh, when we get to the, the, the next module, and I think it's in the next module, in upcoming modules, and we get into details about what you can do with it, you're going to be ahead, uh, all well prepared for, for looking at that in detail. Pretty cool stuff, though. I think you're going to find it uh, really, uh, really a good thing once you get used to it. Now, another thing that uh, we're going to continue to work on is something called GitHub. Uh, but for right now, let's just talk about what it is in general. So often, when you have your code, you can just go ahead and write your code. You can use it yourself. Nobody else can be involved, um, and you're done. So you want to make some little kind of automation scripts for your own individual computer you're done. But if you're working with um, within an organization, you're often making code that uh, performs some kind of automation for other people to have as well. One of the reasons why we're making a, a friendly error message is so other people using our code will have a friendly error message to, to work with. When you have several people working together in a coordinated fashion, either being you're the developer and other people are using your code, or you're one of the developers and you have to collaborate to build these more complex applications that involve many different scripts or many different files. When that occurs, you need to really get organized. And one of the ways that people have been getting organized for quite a while is they just make a network folder or share and they put all the files in there and everybody can go to the same share and see what you did during the day. They can look at your code. You can look at their code. I can review somebody's code and say, oh, I see that you have this code in there. That's really cool. Uh, or oh, I see that you have this. Are you aware that that can cause this problem? I can give advice. They can look at my code and give the same kind of advice. This is really handy. The problem has always been, though, is um, if you, well, the problem has always been where to store it. So usually the traditional way of doing it is to make a folder on some server in your organization, make the, make it, send out an email telling everybody to put their files up there at the end of the day. So when you're done working on your work, put it up there as a, a, a backup point. The idea of course is that if your computer crashes and you were to lose all your work, the backup copies on the, on the network share, that's a good thing. Also, other people can look at it, including your manager, look it over, see where you're at, how far along you are, give advice. Lots of good reasons to do this. Now, as the internet became more prominent, uh, well, let me back up a bit. As networking became more prominent in the late 90s, we started looking at other ways to, to store code files so that multiple people could work with it collectively. And we made these things called source control applications, source control databases, where the application is managing these versions of your files. Now, this is a real handy feature because I can make a version of my application or script on Tuesday and a different version on Wednesday because I fix things or add things. And on Thursday, I have more things. And if for some reason I need to go backwards in time, the 
source control software would have all those different versions. I can, I can see what I did to get to where I'm at currently, or maybe even roll back to where I need to be uh, from a previous version. This is a really cool thing, and we would have this network software installed somewhere in the organization, such as uh, something called Microsoft made called uh, Team uh, Foundation Server, or TFS, very popular one, um, that would store these copies of our script files or our executable files. It's still used today and is very popular. However, one of the more popular things is to move it out of the organization and out of the organization's uh, individual uh, internal servers and make it available on the internet. Now, of course, this has positives and negatives just like anything on the internet. For one thing, you need to have some kind of way of securing it. And second of all, you need to have some kind of company that will host it if you don't want to host it yourself. So you could make your own little web application uh, for your organization and then have that tied back into a file structure or database structure and upload your files to the web from outside, like from your home um, to the organization's website and do source control like when you're working from home or you're out in the field um, on a trip someplace or you're, you're consulting, you're, you're going and you're talking to customers and you upload your script files to the co corporate web server, it dumps the data into folders on the hard drive or maybe databases by converting your, your scripts into ones and zeros and storing it as raw data inside the database. This is a way, this is a way that people have been storing code for decades. And uh, it's not a bad way, but some people got together and said, why don't we go ahead and make a service, a piece of software that you can join and make it inexpensive um, and you can join it and instead of um, being reliant on having your organization set this, this storage uh, folders and databases and stuff to store your code, we will offer this as a service that you can, you can join freely um, for at one level in which case you're just kind of getting started, but we'll charge you if you start doing two, uh, more and more and more at an enterprise level, and that way we can make our money. And to accomplish this, they came up with something called Git, and um, a website called GitHub. And that's something we're gonna be using in this course. For one thing, it's a very popular way of doing it. Now don't, don't be, um, don't be fooled into thinking that it's something really special or something really um, uh, kind of novel. It's really just another way of either storing your code files either on a folder or in a database. You, d you convert your code files into ones and zeros and just dump it into the database. Or you just take the code files and you put them in a share on somebody else's machine. Still doing the same thing, it's just that now we can do so with a third-party application, a third-party application that is very accessible to anybody in the world. Um, and the, the cool thing is, if you learn how to use GitHub and Git, then uh, when you go to a different job or you move to a different department, if they're using GitHub and Git, and a lot of people are, you can easily get um, into uh, setting up the source control for your applications in your new department and your new organization. So Git is a pretty cool piece of software. It's extremely popular in the industry and it's well worth taking a little bit of time to learn and we're going to do that uh, this module. So Git um, allows you to make backups of your code files. It allows you to, to um, share uh, software uh, files uh, with each other, documents with each other. It's extremely popular. GitHub is the website that you can upload your, your files to. It acts as a, a website, in which case you can look at it as a human, but it's also a service, in which case the, um, there's functions that you can call and the service will perform actions. Keep in mind that there's a layer of data, that would be your files. Then there's a processing layer. That's the functions that you call to upload the files to the folders or database that's on GitHub's uh, server and functions that you call to take the data from the databases or files and bring them back down to your machine. 
And of course, then there's the presentation piece. In this case, GitHub presentation piece is a website that you can, you can look at. And here's that website. So it's github.com. And when you get there, you have to either sign up for GitHub or sign in. Now, if you're going to sign up for it, it's going to be tied to a particular email that you have. So if I have, I don't know, some username and it's got to be something that's available. You can see that there's a few of them here already. Uh, so you have to pick something that's available and then uh, you tie that into an email address. And that one's already taken, so I'd have to use something else. That's my personal one. So let's see. Uh, root r at udub.edu. That one's already taken as well. As you can see, you can have lots of them. And then once you have done that, you can log in. Now, if I've already created this, I can just go ahead and log into it. You just have to remember the password for it and sign in. If, of course, if I don't remember the password, hey, I got lucky on this one, then um, at that point I can go through and do the normal password recovery. Now, once I'm logged in, I will have access to these various different what's known as repositories. A repository is a set of, well, think of it as a folder and a bunch of subfolders where you can put stuff. So I would go through and I'd make these uh, repositories and you can make a, a new one by just coming up here, clicking on the new repository button, giving it some kind of name. Let's see, how about fall of 2019? So I'm recording this video right now. Give it some kind of optional description. Um, you can either make it public or private. Now, the um, the free ones, they want you to make it public. That's, and for our course, we want to make it public. Uh, for the private one, this is only you're going to be able to see it. And there's another option if you're paying for GitHub, um, if you're using the enterprise level software. Uh, but for our class, we just want to use public. And then we always want to go ahead and click on this initialize repository with README. We'll put that in there and create the repository. Now, if uh, once you do that, you will have a place to put your files. I mean, you just have to go through and upload the files, click on the L upload button, and you drag the files or go find them on the hard drive. What I got up there? Let's see. Anything good? How about... Uh, oh, we got all those Python files. Let's go ahead and get those. Some PDF files, we'll take one of those. And let's see, we'll put in here, um, let's choose another one here. Got some listing five files, here's another one. Okay, and then we'll, uh, we have two files there, and I just go ahead and put in some extended description if I want it. Um, and then just go ahead and say commit changes. Now, the files are going to be uploaded to the server. That's what's going on. And then once it's uploaded on the server, I can click on them and download them from the server. Of course, in certain types of files, like a PDF file, I can actually see it right on the server, which is really convenient. Um, if it's a code file, it depends on the code files as far as whether or not I'll be able to see it. In this case, uh, it's a Python file, and that's an acceptable format. So it shows up as a Python file, making it really easy for me to, to take a look at. You can even edit this file and make changes. If you do, and commit the changes, then you will end up having a updated file. So I come back over here. I can see that it was updated, um, and if I click on it, I can, let's see, look at history. I can see the different versions here, such as the original version that was uploaded and the updated version I just made a few seconds ago. Now, by making it public, we can actually give permission for people to come out and look at it. We can also give them permission to come out and make edits and changes. They can also 
copy your code. So you can make a, a copy of the code freely uh, that somebody has and, and put it someplace else. And we're going to, to look more at GitHub as we go through the course. Not in a lot of detail. Uh, it could uh, we could actually spend quite a bit of time on it but i want to get you familiar with just kind of knowing what it is and and um just messing around with it uh, so we'll we'll play with it as we we go along anyway it's going to be part of the exercise let's see and i put some some notes in here for you to to look at one thing i do want to to mention is that as you um as you start messing with this, do be aware that if you are concerned about having your name out there, or your email out there uh, on GitHub, if you want, or you're a little bit concerned about security, you can always just make up some kind of fictitious email and use that to uh, create a GitHub account. So you'll, it'll have to be a, re a, a real email account. So you can go out to uh, make a, a file. Firefox account or um, a Microsoft account or a Google account, etc., with just, you know, that's not really tied to your personal life, just account for st your studies and use that. Um, and that way it's not directly tied to you um, in any easy way. And if you need more issue, uh, if you have more issue security concerns, you can certainly talk to me. But um, definitely want you to play with this. I think you're going to find it uh, pretty easy to, to learn how to use, at least at this level. And certainly I've, I've given you some notes here to, to help you get through that process. So in this module, we've looked at how to work with lists and dictionaries and how to improve your scripts using uh, templates, uh, separating the, the code into uh, sections, data section, processing section, um, presentation section, how to use functions, uh, how to read file uh, data from a file and put it into memory in either a uh, dictionary or a list, how to take data from a list or dictionary and put it down into a file for uh, to store the data as persistent between the times that you use the application. Um, and I want you to think about that. These are really core things that you need to do in most of your applications when they involve data. I think you're going to find uh, the techniques you learn in this module to be really um, applicable uh, long term in all kinds of different ways. But take some time to see if you can answer these questions. And if you can, right off the top of your head, fantastic. If not, go back and look at the notes, uh, revisit some of the, the key things that we just talked about in this module until you get it down. And then when you do, you're ready to tackle the assignment, which involves these, these very different things that I've shown you, and uh, move on to the next module. And I will see you there. Take care.